One, two, three. Time again for some more ethology. We have a good one, good one today. As soon as anyone hears me and sees me, give me the thumbs up in our chat and then I know we can get started. And for some more, just in one, two, three. Okay, we're good to go. We're good to go. It's time to get started. Hello everyone, welcome to the stream. Today we are going to be going over a study which was published in 2016 called Dominance Relationships in a Family Pack of Captive Arctic Wolves, the Influence of Competition for Food, Age, and Sex. And this was published by Simona Cafazo, Martina Lazzaroni, and Sarah Marshall Pacini. This was published in 2016, and this is great scaffolding coming off of our other lectures. Particularly, we cannot have a lecture like this without a good understanding of Shankel's work and David Meech's work. So if you're watching this stream, please go back and watch those streams. It's going to give a better understanding of what we are talking about here. And I love this study because it really puts together a lot of the fine details about what normal, natural pack structure is for a wolf. So yes, we are dog trainers here. We're learning how to train dogs and not everything between a wolf and a dog is exactly the same. We had something called domestication that happened, but um, there's no better way to see, to understand the behavior of our dogs in these unnatural environments that are our homes by studying their natural behavior of their undomesticated versions, right? And I love this because it puts a lot of stuff together for us. And around this time, um, 2016, um, there was a lot of good studies out there. And I chose this one because there, there really is, there's tons and tons of good studies out there, but I think this one puts a lot of stuff together for us well and is good information for the professional dog trainer. So I'm gonna get started on this right away. And this one is not as easy reading as the translated um, Shankel studies or the David Meech studies. Um, but what I did is I put together some notes that I think are most important. And just like all the studies that I have here, the great thing about it is you can read them yourself. Please, everyone read these for yourself. If you want to be the best, form your own opinions. I'm going to show you my highlights that I took from the study and how I interpret it in a way that is useful for us as a trainer. So go through it. So on my notes page here, I have lots of notes and I highlighted stuff. It is not the, the full study that I copied down on here. It's an open source study, so anyone could download it and, and go through it. Um, but I have the link right over here. This link right here, if you go to it, brings you to the download page for the study itself. You know, and at the bottom right over here, it says Dominance Relations and Family Pact. You can you could, uh, download it right over right over here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read, first I'm going to read the abstract. I'm not going to go through all these notes. Um, I'm going to read the abstract that has the, the, the points that the publishers wanted you to get from the study. And then I'm going to go over my main points that I took from this. And then I have a visual on the board that I think is going to be very helpful for, for everyone. So. First, I'm going to go over the abstract. This is basically the, the cliff notes that the, you know, the publishers put at the beginning of their study. And the, the study 
what it does, it supports, it supports the abstract. So, so the background of this particular study is, you know, dominance is one of the most pervasive concepts in the study of wolf social behavior. But recently, its validity has been questioned. Now, remember, this was written in 2016. So this was about 17 years after the meat study that caused all kinds of uproar in the dog training community. Uh, for some authors, the bonds between members of wolf families are better described as parent-offspring relationships, and the concept of dominance should be used just to evaluate the social dynamics of non-familial non captive pack members. However, there is a dearth of studies investigating dominance relationships and its correlation in wolf family packs. So... What they did over here in the methods is they took a family, says here we applied a combination of the most commonly used quantitative methods to evaluate the dominance relationships in a captive family pack of 19 Arctic wolves. So by quantitative methods, is mean that they're using um, methods to really record all the behaviors and get numbers in such a way where we could compare it on paper so we have real results. And the results of what they found, and I highlighted some keywords over here, is we found a significant linear and completely transitive hierarchy based on the direction of submissive behaviors and found that dominance relationships were not influenced by the competitive context. So um, what they mean there is by saying that they found linear and transitive, what that means is that what they found is that um, if you have dog A, you know, that, um, you know, you have dog A, B, C, D, and E, that when they form relationships, at least in, in the groups of wolves that they studied, that is linear, meaning that if you have, um, and it's transitive, meaning it's it's one right after the other. A is dominant over B, B is dominant over C, C is dominant over, uh, over D. Transitive means that, that you can assume that if A is dominant over B and B is dominant over C, we can assume that A is dominant over C. So that's basically what it means. Now, there's more to this, right? Because there's more to it because we're gonna you're gonna say we're gonna talk about age groups and sexes and, and stuff like that. Um, it says a significant linear hierarchy also emerges amongst siblings once the breeding pair, the two top ranking individuals, is removed from analysis. Furthermore, results results suggest that wolves may use greeting behavior as a formal signal of subordination, whereas older wolves were mostly dominant over younger ones. No clear effect of sex was found. However, frequency of agonistic, submissive, dominant, and aggressive behaviors was higher between female-female and male-male um, dyads than female-male dyads. Dyads just means pairs. Um, and sex-separated linear hierarchy showed a stronger linearity than the mixed one. Furthermore, dominance status was conveyed through different behavioral categories during intrasexual and intersexual interactions. All right, so so we're gonna I'm gonna break this down now. So in case that confused you, but that's their words over there, and I have it written. Read read the read the whole study, um, and I'm gonna break this down. So this study is what they showed is um is important to understand the concept of linear and linear and transitive. So just like I explained, all right? It means in a row, and uh, if A is dominant over B, B is dominant over C, we could we can assume that A is dominant over C. Okay? So they found this in this particular particular study. All right, it says I'm not clear from the summary whether the authors are talking about captive or non-captive wolf groups. Okay. Um, all right, to jump ahead a bit, they are talking about a captive group, a captive family group of Arctic wolves. All right. So it's captive and it's a, it's a family that started off. You got to read the study, but they started off with just like, I think like three or four wolves. And then, 
and then it grown into a family. And there's also information comparing this study to, um, to what we found in, in the wild, all right? So good question. I'm monitoring the pack, the pack howl over here. So yes, this study was done on captive Arctic wolves that were a family, that had a family, a family structure. Um, and I'm gonna go more, more into that. Um, the next thing, um, the next thing point that they found is, oh, I have a typo here, is hierarchy is present, although there are fewer demonstrations compared to interactions with the breeding pair. Okay, so these, I'm giving you the cliff notes that you can go to with the study, all right? So I'm gonna go right to the board. I think it's just gonna be easier with this way, all right? So this is what they found, right? I'm gonna make this simple. Then you guys could go on the notes. And this doesn't have to be like a very long, complicated lecture over here. I like visuals, all right? Um, this is what they found. This is a combination of information that we sort of knew through other studies and then them adding information to the, to the study. Now, what they found, um, what they found over here is that, yes, that when we have a structure in this study, it was captive, it was captive wolves that formed, that were a family group. In this captive group, what they found is that we have the breeding pair that are the most dominant. Now I put male and female right next to each other over here at the top. The reason why I put this visual is because just like what we found in Schenkel's study and Meech's study, um, they found that it's a very loose hierarchy between them two, that it seems to flip-flop. In this study, for example, they saw, I believe, the, um, the male showing um, submissive behaviors more often to the female and the female showing more dominant behaviors. Um, to the, to the male, um, but it was equal and it was loose. So they definitely seem to be at equal levels. And I think you could compare this. I think it is okay to compare a lot of this to humans. And I like the analogies that just like you can have a couple that's living together or have a family, depending on the situation, they're not really seem to be concerned of who's really in charge so much. And especially in the wild, we saw the context had to do a lot of times with, um, um, with the puppies and stuff like that. But there definitely um, seems to be, you could read the details in the study, that not much conflict between these two are concerned about dominance and about dominance and submissiveness. The next thing that we find um, from the study is that there is a definite um, correlation between age groups and dominance. So what I did is I, I divided this up in the groups as we have the breeding pairs. And in their study, I believe they had mostly um, adults they considered over two years of age, and they had sub-adults that were under two years of age. Remember, wolves are a little bit easier to study than say domestic dogs or comparing this to dogs in groups because wolves only breed once a year, about the same time. And when you have a family unit, they're always clearly, you know, that's it's there's always like one year difference um, between them. In this study, they did not have pups. I'm, I'm just making this clear. There were no pups. They had the breeders, they had adults, and they had sub-adults. And these adults also included secondary breeders um, um, too. But I added this because it's, um, I, what I'm doing is I'm scaffolding the information that we found from Meech and also Shankel. Um, and also, other studies that I found that that will you know that will go over, but I think there's enough information in over here where we can make this chart. That despite what's going on in each of these groups, that what we have is generally all the adults that are not the breeders are going to be submissive to the breeders, um, 
And if we want to get more detailed, you can have secondary breeders that are also going to be submissive to the more dominant breeders. But those would, but what we have is we have definite hierarchy um, within these groups, but all the breeders are dominant over everyone. The adults are dominant over the sub-adults, and we could assume the puppies, all right? This is not in the study, so disclaimer, but I've seen this from other, other studies that we went through already, is that, yeah, that like, you know, um, yearlings tend to be dominant over, over, over pups, all right? So the study confirms some stuff that was, and this was already known through the meat studies, through the meat studies. Now, what is new in this study is now remember, Meech, um, he even says that it was very hard that he saw barely any dominance interactions between the wolves amongst each other outside of the breeding pair enforcing their dominance. Now, what they found in this study is when they're captive, we can observe them, it's easier to observe them, that yes, there is definitely less displays of dominance and enforcement of hierarchy in the lower ranks. The study confirms that, but they have found after observing them that yes, there is definitely a linear hierarchy in the lower ranks, even though you don't see it as much, likely because there's not a need um, to see, um, to really see it as much. But they are within, generally, the different age groups, all right? So the numbers are there. And I put some of the, I put some of the charts there. Next thing that they've seen from this hierarchy, and this helps explain things that we've seen in the Schenkel studies and that we also seen in the Meat studies. Schenkel um, he, he saw in captivity because he was able to watch them more closely that he said there were two basic, um, hierarchies between the males and between the females. Meech, difficult to watch him in the wild. He did not, although he saw the different age groups. Now remember the, um, the Shankle studies, it was mostly just adult, you know, it was mostly just adult wolves and he didn't get to, I don't believe in his studies that he saw as much as the differences between the, the ages. All right. So meat saw the differences in the ages. Shankel saw this linear hierarchies, two separate ones. Now this study, they see both the age difference hierarchies, and they also saw two separate um, linear structures, but not cut and dry. What they saw, and this is very interesting, is yes, the males and the females definitely had, um, were more concerned or had more interactions about hierarchy within the same sexes. But there was definitely, even though it was fewer in between, that there was definitely, according to their their analysis that there was, even though it was less clear, there seemed to be a hierarchy also between the males and females within the group. Although there was just less of it, go, there was less of it going on. So that's why I put this separation over here. And this is new. It did not seem to have anything to do with the sex. Where if you go back to the Shankle study, he said the male was definitely the you know the male was definitely more um, dominant than the female. Meech's study said the male was mostly dominant over the female, um, except for when she was having puppies. This study showed at least that you know that there was less conflict between the two. So, like I say, there's lots of gray areas between this, but all studies sort of show that these two get along really well. There's not a lot of really really a lot of conflict. But what we see down here that there was not, and I randomized how I put this order, right? So I put within the group, female, male, male, female. I put male, female, male, female. I did this on purpose. This doesn't correlate with the exact um, 
numbers within the study, but I just wanted to highlight that there does not seem to necessarily be kind of like equals within this group, even though you get, I think they call them like um, negative D ads, meaning um, that when they were doing things, because there's just less interaction, sometimes with some of the wolves, there was no data to even compare, um, that there was just no conflicts um, to even record between some of them. But what they did get was, um, did seem to be consistent. And they were basing that off of information, which is also information we see in the Schenkel studies, based mostly off submission. Submission is a much more reliable indicator and you see it more often um, to determine um, hierarchy, all right? Because the submission just gets volunteered more often and the canines aren't necessarily going around asserting themselves and showing dominant body postures, but you see much more um, submissive interaction. Um, the next thing that we saw in here is that there was a difference between how the males and the females tended to um, enforce or, or reaffirm or however you want to call it, um, their, their hierarchies. Um, I put a chart over here. Um, let's see. This is from the study. This is an ethogram, right? So this shows how they were, if they were calling something dominant behavior, they were using these, you know, if um, they were standing tall, standing over, pawing up, getting, you know, riding on top of them, head on, you know, like the like the teeing off, muzzle bite, dominant approach. They were calling these dominant behaviors. And the submissive behaviors are the crouching and withdrawing active and passive submission. Aggressive behaviors were classified as things that were showing like an actual threat attack, knocking some, knocking another wolf down, pinning them, chasing and snap biting. What they found is that, um, is that, and this is kind of cool because you hear this just when you have dog trainers that have been in the trenches for years and years. I used to hear this all from way back in the beginning when I started training. I would always hear, oh, Female and female aggression is always the worst. Those dog fights are always worse than the male on male. Now, what they found, and I found this too, working as a professional dog trainer, when there's dog on dog aggression issues within the house, I tended to find that the females um, were worse or more, or more frequent. I would get more calls from the females. And what they found is the males tended to enforce with dominance and submission, um, showing submissive displays and the dominance postures going by the ethogram that I just put on the screen. What they found with the females is that they, um, is they reinforced theirs with submission and there was much more aggressive. Um, instead of showing dominance displays, they would go right more to more like using their teeth and aggression and knocking down and stuff like that. Um, and they did offer some explanations why that could be. One of them, as I got to always consider the details of the study, is that while they were observing these, it was around the time um, during the months when they would normally be getting ready to go into like estrus and be able to breed and stuff like that, the females too. So there's likely more, um, so that could have something to do with it. I have also found that so this is not, be, this is just giving you my own experience, I have found too that aggression can get worse with females when people have intact females together and stuff like that. Remember, domestic dogs, the majority of the different breeds go into heat cycles more often than a wolf. Wolf goes into heat cycle once a year. Dogs on average go twice a year. Um, in, some, in some cases, even, even, um, even more than that, all right? So, so, so read those studies. That is, um, so this visual, I think, is really helpful to sort of explain how the structure, um, you know, gives us a clearer, a, a clearer visual of what a normal in captivity with a family, what it's supposed to look like. Now, remember, we had discussion about 
uh, captive wolves versus free wolves and stuff like that. Now, this is here to form your own opinion, right? The authors of this publication gave us some information. I have my own opinion. You form your own opinion, right? That's the beauty of going to the source, the source material and, and learning in this way. I have, um, let's see, where did they, somewhere in my notes over here um, um, that I had it, is they basically, okay, I highlighted this over here. This is their opinion on it. And I tend to agree that they wrote, um, I'll make this a little bigger right here. They said in a, they said it is undeniable that results with wild animals are preferable when exploring such topics. Um, however, it is interesting to note that in a meta anal in a meta analysis, including 113 studies looking at dominant structures in 85 species, 172 different groups found that whether studies that were conducted in the wild or in a captive setting did that it did not affect the results. With such elusive species as wolves, partial reliance on captive studies is probably unavoidable. However, future research using the same methodologies adopted here on wild animals would be particularly important to further our understanding of wolves' social behavior. Okay, so... So they mentioned that if we go by, you know, if we look at analysis, you know, if, if we kind of look at the other studies, that this is most likely true um, with wild wolves, I would tend to agree. But there are it is very, very hard to get this kind of close observation with with wild wolves. So we do the best that I can. I can also say about this is remember, as dog trainers, we are dealing with captive dogs, right? Um, that cannot separate, they cannot do anything. So we're actually, in my opinion, we get even more accurate information as it pertains to us, since we're normally dealing with dogs that are captive, cannot get away with each other. And actually most resemble what you see in the first Shankle study of unrelated, um, of unrelated dogs, often of equal ages. The all the things that we have to consider here is why we have to put all this information together. Why we have to put all this information together is things change, all right? It's like we're rarely ever gonna encounter a situation like this. And even if we do, if we have an owner that has a pair of dogs that had puppies, eventually the puppies become adults and we get more and more adults just living together where they would where they would disperse. So this is our way of putting a lot of information um, together. Art says, do the authors of the study define dominance in the same way as we do here? Yes, because they're, they're piggybacking um, off of the information and, um, you know, the information of the other ethologists. So, so they pretty much, that's the cool thing about when you're looking at these studies is they're, they're they always highly reference past, um, past studies. And matter of fact, if we, if we go to the, my, my guess is if we go to the actual study and we, you know, they're, yeah, if you see they're, they're highly, highly, highly referenced in here. And, um, and a lot of this information here is going to go right back to, you know, when we go into the references, I'm sure we're going to find, um, yeah, we see Shankle in there. I'm sure we're gonna find Meech. Yeah, we're gonna find we're gonna find Meech in there. And this is what's cool. The further we go along, remember, like these first studies when we were when we were like looking at um, Lorenz and even the Shankle studies, so much they had no, not nearly as many references as we have when we get into these later studies. They just have so much information. There's so much studies here. If you just look at the references and you can look these up to dig in deeper and deeper to go into the rabbit hole, all right? Like a lot of these are on wolves and canines and dominance. You can just go go through this. But if they're not using common terminology, um, you wouldn't be able to do research like this. So, which we find different, all right? We find different in the, the world of professional dog trainers. And this is how I believe is what we do to get on the same page, make it a more respectable career, um, have good information that 
that works. And I, and I, I can vouch um, for me by me referencing actual studies. It has made it so much easier for me to troubleshoot behavior problems and become and be successful at it and watch other trainers do the same thing because it's not really guesswork. Like it's based on it's based on real information and it's so much e easier to further to further your education and update yourself by by looking what is going on in research. And we haven't even gotten into the research on domesticated domesticated dogs and and they talk about that in this study. They they talk this was in 2016, but they were talking about that there really hasn't been much respect towards studying domestic dogs because a lot of researchers, you know, feel that it's so basic basically what they said, this is my own words, is um that they're so distorted. There's so many factors, you know, when you bring them into, to, into the human environment and what domestication has done, but they have them. They have studies out there and we will go over them. And the studies are really cool when we compare them to the wolf studies. That's why we do the wolf studies. We do the wolf studies first. Um, really, this is super helpful, this stuff. Um, let's see, I'm going to go back. So I'm not going to go over all these notes or else this will be a long, boring stream, but they're here. But what I am going to do is, um, is I'm going to do, I'm going to give you my takeaways from this study. Read it, read it yourself. There's information in there you might find interesting that I haven't spoken about. You could draw your own conclusions. One is, um, is one thing that sticks out for me is that. You hear this a lot. The people say, oh, if someone's training using dominance. They're out of date by 20 or 30 years or whatever. So true. So I believe misunderstanding dominance and using it as a physical training technique is at least 20 years, probably 30 years out of date, right? So when you hear like, when you hear a trainer talking about dominance and you got to be the boss and you got to alpha roll them and stuff like that. So when you're hearing about using dominance and it's in an incorrect way, way that does not make sense or does not really correlate with the behaviors that you see over that you see over here the stuff we talked about this already we talked about this in the previous streams that's why it's good to do these in order my takeaway is not only is that way way out of date if you're a trainer doing that like you're like 20 easily probably 30 years out of date with your information this also tells me that when you hear because it's still floating around the internet misunderstandings about dominance and claiming it isn't relevant behavior. Sorry for all my typos over here on my, on my notes. I, um, I gotta fix this. It, okay, but misunderstanding dominance and claiming um, it isn't relevant behavior or doesn't exist at all is also way out of date, all right? You can look at this study, which is 2016, and even technically, Going back, a lot of it is misinterpretations of even 1999 studies. So when we have trainers or behaviors talking about, oh, no, dominance isn't relevant or something like that, you can see a common theme in all of these studies is they're all talking about how important it is to understand dominance when you're evaluating the behavior of canines together. So anyone that claims that it's not important, it's not important to trainers, they are also way out of date, all right? They're way, way, way out of date, not informed. They're not upkeeping their, their education as, as they should. Um, but this is professional dog training and there are no one, there are no real standards. There are real no licensing. So whether you believe there should be or not, that's just the truth, right? I'm just giving you the information that we have, all right? So my takeaway is there's a lot of people that have out-of-date information. It's definitely relevant, and you could form your own opinions. We can only You can only create the type of opinions um, that you need by looking at the source information. Next takeaway is this is really good for seeing normal versus abnormal behaviors when doing evaluations. And this is something that we'll learn about training dogs, is just because this is what's normal, all right, um, is what tends to be normal and causes less conflict, it does not mean that um, people will say like, oh, well, this isn't true. I've seen like circular hierarchies where one dog is dominant over dog B, dog B is dominant over C, then C is dominant over dog A, all right? Um, 
I'm not saying that that doesn't exist. And I've definitely seen evidence in situations in homes where things like that have existed, especially when you bring some new dogs together. But normally you want to recognize you want to recognize normal versus abnormal because that's what you're doing. When you sometimes when you have something that's not really working out inside of a home, you need to identify why it's not working out, just like it doesn't work out with humans, right? When they're working together as a group, if you have, you know, in certain situations, you know, business applications, it could work, you know, when you have, you know, some sort of balance of, of power. But in, in dogs in particular, we you'll see more issues when we have something that's out of whack, which can definitely happen, right? So remember, I'm not telling you the way it always is. I'm telling you what tends to be normal in captive and with some details missing what they've seen in wild interactions with each other. So I put, you know, just little notes there. This was just off the top of my head, you know. Um, dominance conflicts with young dogs. Sometimes you will see, and it gives, it does a red flag where someone brings home like a puppy and the puppy is having, is, is having, dominance conflicts um, with adult dogs, okay? Um, where normally I do not call that normal behavior, but you will see abnormal behavior. So when the owners are like, why is this happening? Like this never happened when I brought home a puppy. One of the first things that we need to know is what is normal behavior? What's abnormal behavior? So when we have abnormal behavior, we have to go in and create a fix or a workaround or stuff like that. So it's important to know, we got to know what's normal versus abnormal because sometimes owners will call you and they'll be like, well, I just got these two. I have this dog that's a year old and we just adopted this five-year-old dog, but I want the one-year-old dog to be dominant because he was here first. And they want you to create like the pecking order, right? So we have to be able to tell them like, well, what's normal and natural versus what's unnatural? What what are we able to do? You know, we cannot wa um, wave magic wands and stuff like that. So, so all this is going to be important to us um, as dog trainers. Also things with conflicts with same sex age. Um, again, going back to helping people decide um, what they, you know, what they should get, you know, when they want to get another dog for the family and they happen to have an intact, you know, male dog that's, three years old and they want to go get another one that's you know that's three or four years old it has to be done a little bit more carefully and even more careful if you're going to have like intact female dogs stuff like this so it helps people to make decisions and it lets us know you'll you'll see we just saw on one of our q a's recently with uh, our trainer ryan like carefully putting together introducing his uh five-year-old male dogo and five-year-old um, um, ger you know, female German Shepherd that we're going to have to interact with each other more, that we're both intact males. It's not something to take lightly, which requires more professional guidance for it to happen without injury and stuff like that. And you saw because he knew that information, he was safe. He had the muzzles on. He did it the right way. There's a right relationship with the dogs, and he's on a he's on he's on the right the right track with it. Um. um Intact breeding. Oh, yeah. So, so I mentioned that humans also what we found in in the study, it confirms things and 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 explains why even in the meat studies, too, that he just Meech did not see a lot of conflicts in the lower ranks. Right. He saw parent wolves that were mostly leading and there was not much going on 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 the lower ranks. It wasn't like the Shankle studies with all the adults where there seemed to be much more, much more aggression. Um, this can, you know, if we kind of try to think of how we can apply this, even though this does, this is meant, this publication is meant just all for, for understanding wolf behavior. But the way that I apply this, this is my opinion as a trainer, that's really helpful in the way that I, way that I teach is if we tend to do a lot of the things that the parent wolves do, right? Um, in the study, 
the wolf, the parent wolves, by far, there was the most interactions with them, submission and control and displays and stuff like that, that if we tend to take that role and we're in the control of most of the things, especially when we have a lot of packs, we can expect that there'll be less going on and less conflict and and the lower ranks or two other dogs won't take that role and kind of lead and take charge of things. So, so we can sort of look at this and see which ones, when we have a group, tend to be involved the most and be in basically the, the, the peacemakers, the peacekeepers, um, we can take that role. That is something that I, that I took from there. And a little reminder, even though that really spoken about, it talks about interaction with food and um, something else that I should talk about is I did not see any information in this study, so don't take it out of context, about um, food, about resource guarding, where the food is, if it was already owned or if it was um, unclaimed resources. So um, be careful how you take the information um, with, the, with the food. Despite all this information, it's just a reminder, don't confuse resource guarding, right? If you want to add to this, this is not specifically spoken about in the study, but I'm going off the information that's in the earlier studies. And even my, my um, personal experience is that, remember, resource guarding, we're talking about dominance and first right to limited resources. Um, and we also correlated this with leadership the, um, the correlation between dominance and leadership and the stream before this, I meet your studies on leadership. Um, those things are going to be pretty consistent. Don't forget that food in the ownership zone is outside of this context, right? According to Meech's studies, a, a puppy was able to successfully guard against even, even parents, you know, once it's in there. And there was even though, so there was really no correlation with the, uh, with the resource guarding. And the other thing that they found here is because you do hear um, other information that's that's out there about that it was very, it was very, very consistent, that it wasn't really context, um, context related. That um, like in other species, you may get like females that are more successful in guarding food compared to males because they tend to need the food more because they're breeding. The study shows, they, they said probably because naturally dogs, you know, the males help to um, also deliver the food to the puppies and everything, that everything seems to be, for the most part, equally important between the sexes and everything like that. So if they're dominant in one situation, they're, they're generally, according to the analytics that we have, they're dominant in all situations. I mean, there's a limited resource, they both want it. It's pretty, it's pretty um, consistent about it. So I think this was a great study. There's a lot of, there's a bunch of other studies, especially around this time period that goes over things like this. Um, but I thought this was a really good one. And it get, we, remember, we always want a reference material. We need reference material to the knowledge, you know, when we're teaching something and someone says, where'd you get that information? We do not want to say I got the information off a TV show or, or you heard some other trainer say it or something like that. Oh, always go to the reference, always go to the reference material. So I believe that's all we got from this one. Um, that's important. And we're going to keep moving along. Reminder to... Watch these things in order. This, um, just to give you guys an idea, this, this stream is very helpful if you go right through these. The Rudolf Shankles, the two Rudolf Shank. I would even go over the Ethology intro. Um, and then definitely the Rudolf Shankle, Shankle on submission, Wolf, the Meech and Wolf Ethology, and the Meech on leadership. Um, before you go through this one to get the to get the most out of it. It'll give you the strongest base for your knowledge. And we're gonna be using this information directly when, when making our training plans with our domesticated versions of these incredible animals. So thank you everyone for watching this live. If you're watching the replay, you can watch me in double speed and save time. And um, 
I guess it's too late to say that. It's the end of the stream. So um, I'll be back. I'll be back Wednesday for the Q&A for Q&A for the, the members of the of the site.